Hello, this is the Growth League Podcast. My name is Caleb Clark, and my mission for this show is pretty simple. It's to learn from marketers on how they're playing the great game of marketing leadership. Their ideas, experiences, perspective, wins and losses, and the playbook that they've established over time. Listen, there's more than one way to lead a marketing team and a marketing function. So if you're a VP, a CMO, director, or someone aspiring to fill one of these marketing leadership roles in the future, tune in to learn from some of the best in the business. Whatever way you need to be recognizing the people you're managing, absolutely, I think that's integral to keeping people happy. But I think the big thing is just keeping people focused on things that they can control. So mm. making sure that like like everyone on my team has key results that they own. That doesn't mean that there are things that don't go from other people that, you know, are those things are contingent on, but it means that like ultimately they're the ones who are driving the ship. Like they control um, whether or not we hit that KR and whether or not they need further support in order mm. to do it. So I think having that like okay, these are the things that are within my control. These are the things I own. And I kind of understand how they ladder up to the larger strategy. I think that's super important. And then obviously just like, we spend so much time at work. Like not every meeting has to start with like, all right, and here's the agenda. And you know, like making sure people feel like people at the end of the day. I know it's really cringe to say things like bring your whole self to work, (laughs) but I want people to feel like they can be themselves at work. I am here with my guest, Megan Healy. She's the VP of Marketing at Dig Insights. Megan, we've chatted once already, but it's been a little while. How how are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing pretty good. I have a bit of a cold that just took me out for for a few days. But other than that, bouncing back, doing pretty good. The sun's out these days, which is nice. Glad to hear you're feeling better. And we all know whether you're uh, sick or healthy, the game doesn't doesn't slow down for us as leaders. <laughs> Before we get into the conversation, I just want you to give me and us a bit of a kind of Cole's Notes view of your evolution, your journey as a marketer and a marketing leader. And what brought you to today? So I originally thought I wanted to be an English professor. This is like way back when, but I did my master's in English Lit was like, yep, this is what I'm going to do with my life. And I got into my master's program and very much realized that I did not want to be an academic for a variety of reasons, but um, kind of went back to the drawing board and ended up for fun, mainly deciding to move abroad. So I moved to London right after my master's in the UK. And I ended up being there for almost nine years. And that's relevant because I ended up being in London at like the time where the startup scene was really just kind of like kicking off in like the Silicon Valley, so to speak, of yeah. London. So I ended up getting a couple internships. One of those ended up being as like a content writer for a research technology startup. And I ended up being there for six years and kind of did almost every role. Like I really <laughs> didn't know where I wanted to end up. I always joke. I think there was a time where I joined, I I was like an account manager, a customer support person, and it like a a sales professional. I wrote some copy for the website on the side, uh, managed our CRM. It was just like ran the gamut essentially of absolutely everything that you could do. And actually ended up in sales before I ended up in marketing. So I ended up sort of moving up and, and being like a head of sales for that company. Kind of realized I wanted to go back to my more creative roots. I love sales. I love the hustle, but it's just a lot of the same. Like I didn't feel like I was being creatively stimulated. So I ended up moving more into a product marketing and content role for another research research technology company before deciding to move home to Canada about a year into the pandemic, which I'm sure is a a story that a lot of people can resonate with, like wanting to be closer to home when COVID, when COVID hit. And I joined Dig Insights, which is a research agency that has sort of a a technology side of the business. So that's my, that's my journey into marketing. And what do you get paid to do today at Dig Insights? What's your mandate? What are you called to do? There's sort of a couple of different things as most marketers can attest to. So, I mean, at the end of the day, marketing is there to drive demand, which means driving brand awareness and consideration in the market and then ultimately driving pipelines. So if you ask me, we use OKRs, what my sort of EKRs are, it's pipeline creation, driving brand consideration, driving engagement with the brand through social, 
and just generally, and particularly in the U.S., that's where we're focused right now. But yeah, just generally getting the the dig brand out there and then converting that business. Um, right. How how much of a part of your role is related to team management, facilitation, empowerment? And I know it's probably a lean internal marketing. How, how does that part of your yeah. job look? I mean, that's one of my favorite parts of the job. I would say it's a a large part of my job. So we have seven, I have seven people on the marketing team, but if this is the first time in my career where I've had, I manage sort of a senior manager and a couple of other managers, one being events, one being a designer and the other being a content manager and they have people that they manage. So it's the first time that I've ever sort of had that, like, I'm not managing every person on the team. So that's right. been quite a bit to to grapple with and just make sure I'm doing correctly. I have no idea if I am, but I'm trying. But yeah, I would say like creating the structure for the team, making sure everyone's working towards the same goals, making sure everyone's happy. That's a huge part of my role. With with a team that is, you know, there's a couple different layers there. Each one probably has their own set of OKRs and, and that type of thing. What have you found in in playing this game of marketing leadership has been most effective for you? And getting everyone to go in the right direction, congruent with the objective of the organization as a whole, as compared to everyone kind of going their own way. Yeah, that's a really good question because it's something that we or I grappled with a lot last year because the team grew a lot last year. And because I'd never had anyone on a team I was managing that I wasn't directly managing. I think I was almost over communicating. Like I was telling everyone there was almost too much noise. And I think what's helped is we actually only built OKRs into sort of our corporate objectives and all of our departmental objectives this year. And I think that's really helped streamline like what I need to communicate to everyone and Mm -hmm. what I don't need to communicate to everyone. Like, of course I need to communicate, you know, what's going on from a senior leadership perspective, where we're going as a company, then on a day-to-day basis, like not everyone needs to be in everyone's pockets. Like we need to be focused on the key results that we're associated with. So for instance, like a, a content coordinator on my team doesn't necessarily need to know all of the feedback for content that she's not in charge of. Like it, just trying to cut out some of that noise and cut out some of the, the endless Slack communication has been, I think, I really helpful for the team. Yeah. So that's been a big learning for me because I remember being, you know, a coordinator or a manager and really wanting to understand like what is going on in all aspects. But ultimately there's a certain amount, it's it's a really delicate balance, but there's a certain amount that's like too much noise and you just don't need to tell everyone everything. Right. I don't know if that's how that's... how other people feel, but that's definitely how I feel. No, I think that that's great. I, you know, um, it sounds to me and I don't based on what you shared that there is an opportunity based on, you know, deciding what to get communicated, what doesn't get communicated, where you can filter out the noise and keep everyone oriented to the main thing. Let's make the main thing to me yeah. and then allow them to be professionals in their craft to, to now. Yeah. And it's, it's ultimately like, honestly, not really about productivity. Like it's about, it's about keeping people happy at work. Like there, there's so much, everyone in marketing knows, like there's so much feedback, especially if you work in content marketing or product marketing, like everyone has feedback about everything. I think my team's doing a fantastic job. If there's like, like not everyone needs to know all of the feedback about every specific thing, because that can feel a little demoralizing. Like it can almost feel like, are people not recognizing, you know, the amount of work that's going into this or, having all of the feedback kind of about something that they can't control, I think can, again, be a little demoralizing. So a lot of it is just about like team morale and keeping it up. So, so put some more on that in terms of what does it mean to you for someone to be happy at work or what does it mean to your team to feel happy at work? I think you feel happy at work if you feel recognized and everyone wants to be recognized in different ways, but getting the recognition that like put the work in and people are acknowledging it. I mean, I'm like an extrovert through and through. So like (laughs) publicly praise me all you want. I'm like happy with it. (laughs) Some people don't love that, but no, I think just like whatever way you need to be recognizing the people you're managing. Absolutely. I think that's integral to keeping people happy. 
But I think the big thing is just keeping people focused on things that they can control. So mm. making sure that like, like everyone on my team has key results that they own. That doesn't mean that there are things that don't go from other people that, you know, are, those things are contingent on, but it means that like, ultimately they're the ones who are driving the ship. Like they control um, whether or not we hit that KR and whether or not they need further support in order mm. to do it. So I think having that like, okay, these are the things that are within my control. These are the things I own. And I kind of understand how they ladder up to the larger strategy. I think that's super important. And then obviously just like, we spend so much time at work. Like not every meeting has to start with like, all right, and here's the agenda. And, you know, like making sure people feel like people at the end of the day. I know it's really cringe to say things like bring your whole self to work, (laughs) but I want people to feel like they can be themselves at work. For sure. I think that's great. I heard being able to, you know, control what's in your ability to control and and not, you know, make people accountable to things outside their control to show recognition in the ways that these different people want to be recognized and making sure that they can see a direct line of relevance between what they're doing Mm. in a day and the so what from an organizational standpoint, purpose or impact, uh, meaning. Yeah. That's what I hear. That's great. And and I think that you've in Embodied based on what you're sharing, the role of a marketing leader, how that evolves is to creating this, this place for people to feel happy, right? That's cool. What about what I'm curious is what would you and your team all sort of unanimously agree on as being the biggest challenge that your marketing department faces today? The way that our, our company is structured, we have a parent company, Dig Insights, which is an agency, and we have a product which is a SaaS solution. And we have two separate websites for those brands. And it can be really challenging to make sure that we are budgeting and resourcing appropriately against the different requirements for both of those brands. That's like been a totally new ball game for me. I've never worked anywhere where I've had to support two brands. Right. Learned so, so much. Done a lot of things wrong. But yeah, I think... That's probably the biggest thing. So just people understanding, like, how do I prioritize when I have seven things to do? And two, you're making it more complicated by having two brands across which they might be working. So a good example is my senior designer. If she has like nine tickets that she needs, how does she know if she should prioritize working on a deck that we're going to be pitching to a client, an infographic for the content team, or like a conference pitch deck, like right. which which happens first. So yeah, definitely priorities. And again, I guess that, that just goes back to your KRs. And so it's just instilling that like, okay, the infographic can probably go. That client is going to be immediate revenue. And let's look at like the way that our product team would. Let's look at like effort versus impact. It's probably right. going to be the conference deck and the the client deck. This is just an example. Like so is, is there, example, is but there yeah. a ritual? Is there a ritual that you've kind of implemented or facilitated where there is an opportunity to define priority is, in a group, or is everyone left to their own their own ways of identifying? <laughs> I wish I had an answer for you that was like, yeah, no, I've created a system where we no, we don't really have that right now. I think a lot of it is. The OKRs are new for people and we've grown so much that right now it's just instilling in people what the priorities are because Q1 was our first time, like our first go at developing the key results. So sometimes it's just like having that conversation in a one-to-one where it's like, okay, like you're feeling like you have, you know, these disparate projects on, let's look back at like, what's actually going to move those numbers. Okay. So let's prioritize this, this, this. Right. So it's very ad hoc right now. I wouldn't say that there's like a, a system, but good idea. I, should probably well, that. I think, I think the point I try to make here is that I think sometimes these systems and processes are elusive, but nothing, nothing can replace just having conversation and communication and getting on the same, yeah. page, right. On a, even if it's on a daily, weekly basis, those systems and processes will come, but this is part of the playing the game, isn't it? Yeah, of course. Yeah. And I don't know how I would, it's tough to imagine how I would do that 
Yeah, I'll have to think about it because, like, obviously, uh, many people have different priorities. Like, I, I don't know how I would develop a system. One to think about. One to think about. That's good. For you, whether it's formally documented or more like gut felt, how do you know personally whether or not at the end of a day you've done a good job as a marketing leader? Is there anything that you've implemented for yourself to? be able to quiet those voices a little bit or to confirm, yeah, we're going in the right direction. Yeah. I'll get really vulnerable. That is something that I like struggle with so, so much. Like what is enough? Because Mm -hmm. the easy answer would be, yeah, the easy answer would be whether we're hitting our goals, but there's an intangible sort of like personal element to that of even if you are hitting your goals, do you still feel, do you, do you feel like you're doing enough at that point? So I actually worked with a coach or started working with a coach on this in terms of like, how do you, and my company has been amazing in terms of like helping me to do that because I, I would love to get to a point where other than like hitting your goals, being able to feel like, okay, I know that we're kind of on the right track. I think especially when you've got a new team and your organization is growing really rapidly, like it can be really hard to take a step back and be like, okay, like everything's looking good because you have aggressive targets and um, you're kind of in the thick of it every day. So I don't really know if I have an answer for you. I'm still trying to figure it out. Again, food for thought, right? Yeah. (laughs) I bring it out because it's important. I mean, there's, there is the easy answer, which is, did we hit our goals or not? But there's so much uh, nuance in between starting and hitting. As marketing leaders, we need to know for ourselves if we're adding impact, but also how do we allow for others on our team to know you did a good job today, right? (laughs) Beyond just did the results, did a good job. Yeah. And I, I guess... One way I've seen it done well is at my previous company, we did 360 feedback from like other, not not leaders necessarily, but just like other departments. Like I might have like a developer give me feedback and a customer success manager and I would do the same. The only struggle with that is like, it takes a while. <laughs> like if you're going to do 360 feedback with lots of people. But I say that that can help because it shows you how, what you're doing impacts roles that don't sit, that sit outside of like the quote unquote, like key results or like the KPIs that you're trying to move. So I do think that that can be really rewarding and valuable to just understand like the impact that you're having around the business. But yeah, Yeah. it can be a challenge to set up in a smaller org. Is there a component of your marketing mix right now that you and your team feel so confident on because it's delivered results? And if you had endless amounts of budget, you would double down there. And on the flip side of that question, is there an area that you as a team know that you want to improve, but it's not there yet? It represents a gap. Yeah. So we are really, really lucky because we have so many. So basically our target audience, researchers and marketers, and we have so many like really, really seasoned researchers that work at our company. Mm -hmm. So our content and our conference presentations are like, I mean, obviously I'm biased, but some of the best, they're amazing. Like when we put a report together, there's qualitative involved, there's quant involved, like the insights are really relevant and juicy because these people that we do them in part, the reports in partnership with, like really know the categories, they know how to develop really good research. So the thing that's working really well is our thought leadership and our content, like that top of the funnel, getting people to digest our content. Um, On the flip side of that, I think where we're still struggling is really understanding the like middle of the funnel or the bottom of the funnel and like, how do we convert people? And really that the main channel we're leveraging is LinkedIn. I'm sure most marketers are B2B or like all over LinkedIn. We're using um, search as well, of course, but um, that's more from like a, a capture demand perspective. Like if someone's Googling for a use case right. um, that we can satisfy, I think where paid social comes into play is like, how can we really like get the most out of LinkedIn and make sure that our, our messaging and like our, our creative is really hitting And we have not nailed that. Um, And that's, yeah, like an ongoing thing that we're we're focused on just getting closer to our our buyers, but then also just iterating and and A-B testing on our ads and our creative. For you in the midst of uh, challenges or opportunities, what does capacity constraint, which we all have as marketing leaders and especially with lean teams, what role does capacity constraint play 
for you guys in not being able to do everything that you want to do? And and how does that show up? How do you mitigate against capacity constraint amidst that? I mean, one thing we have, which is amazing, but can be really hard internally is we just have so many ideas. Mm-hmm. And so we have like almost too many ideas, like, and they're all quite good. I mean, not all, there's some duds in there, but like, <laughs> I would say most of them, I'm like, man, that would be so great. I'm sure everyone can relate to this. So one really tactical way that we manage that is when people have ideas and they send them to like the marketing at email address, right. we've got a parking lot, we park them in there. Um, we make sure we review them on a quarterly basis to see if like, it makes sense to pull something up. Um, but honestly, I think the key way that I've been able to mitigate um, having to go after those ideas is alignment on budget with my boss and C-suite right. in at the right time. So before the new year starts, we have a yearly, we have a yearly budget and we have conversation, conversation around conferences, like paid social spend, uh, paid search spend, um, you know, our expectations of like how many, um, client service VPs we're going to be able to collaborate with for these reports that we run. And when that's agreed, that's baked into the budget. And so I've kind of got the CFO backing me, right? Like we can't just, we can't do another conference because right. it's not baked into the budget. Um, I would love to, yeah. but we don't have the capacity um, and we don't have the budget. So yeah. that's really helped. Have you had any experience in, uh, I, I believe strongly in, in close relationships which, between the CFO and marketing leadership, whether it's at Dig Insights or in, in companies in the past, um, have you ever found yourself in a scenario where you needed to have a reorientation of, of budget strategy with CFO? Like say a great idea comes and it's a unique opportunity. What would you give as advice if you have an experience here um, in saying, Let's have a meaningful conversation, CFO, and reallocate based on new factors. Yeah, that's a good question. I I have. Um, I think it's funny. I mean, it's funny to think about things in silos. So what I mean by that is like, we wanted to do a conference, which like all in, I think was going to be about 50 kegs. We're like flying people over. This is at a point last year. And we were part of, we had like a great um, client co-presenter. It was, it was a great opportunity, but I was like, oh my God, 50 extra grand, like to add to the budget. Like, I don't know, like how this, you know, how our CFO is going to gonna <laughs> manage that. And of course, like I'm, you know, boiling away over this, like freaking out, yeah. have a conversation with our CEO and our CFO. And they're like, that's like a multi-million dollar account. We don't, I don't know if I can swear on this. Like, we don't, <laughs> we don't care. We, we don't give a fuck about 50 yeah. grand. Like you want to take this client to like a really cool conference and they're willing to go like, yeah, let's add it to the budget. So, I mean, that's kind of a silly anecdote, but I think remembering it in the context of your organization, right? Like, yes, of course, 50 grand is 50 grand, but if it's a multi-million dollar account and it gives them three days to chill mm-hmm. with a, with a client, the industry I'm in is very much about relationships. So like the fact that they can do that is amazing. It's like, that's gold dust, right? right? So I think framing the context of it is really important. And then, yeah, just hopefully being really diligent about um, if you don't already have data to back up how an engagement like that would be helpful, being really diligent about saying like, let's experiment with this. Experiment's a good word. Yeah. Let's experiment yeah. with it and then make sure you're tracking. Right. the impact of it. So like for us, it wouldn't be, you know, it's an existing client. It's not like we're saying like, we're bringing on, you know, brand new business from this, from this account, but maybe we meet another person from yeah. the client organization. Maybe we, maybe there's some incremental revenue added to it because um, they were exposed to a new, uh, new product that we offer or something right. like that. So just thinking about how you can spin the ROI of it, because of course there is ROI, but you need to be able to prove it. Interesting. So it sounds like that story, that account, that conversation you had brought you uh, or, or helped you evolve a little bit in terms of understanding the intersection of, of business and marketing, right? How, how much has yes. been a, a growth area for you? Oh, massive. Yeah. I mean, I don't think I've ever been in a role before this one where I had 
a relationship with the chief financial officer. Like I, I wasn't senior enough. I was like a head of, I had, so I actually reported into chief revenue officer right. at my previous company. And then I reported into the head of sales before. So um, yeah, I don't think I've ever, and it's something that I think about all the time. Like now I'm part of senior leadership at my current company. And it's just so funny when you attend, you know, like a, an offsite, for instance, and you see everything that's going on around you from a business perspective. And you're like, oh, I understand why X wasn't a priority and why was, or nice. um, just the financial figures that they care about are completely different from the ones I care about. Um, or I, I used to care about. And now of course I know that I need to care about the ones that, you know, right. the CEO and the CFO are talking about every day. So yeah, it's been a huge learning curve and I by no means am I like an expert, but um, yeah, learning every day. Well, that perspective is uh, so helpful when it comes to then having conversation with your team around priorities and what are we doing? Because it's a different lens. Because otherwise, I think a lot of marketers, when they're cut off from that type of insight and, and access, it's like you can only look at the budget and see that as a ceiling yeah. or you know whatever. So. Um, that's cool. A couple more things for you that that come up a lot. I'm curious on your perspective, uh, whether it be at Dig or organizations in the past, have you had experience in uh, in managing a balance between internal team members and external support, whether that be contractors, vendors, agencies, whatever? What mm -hmm. experience have you had there, and what uh, what's worked really well for you in creating that perfect marriage, and what hasn't yeah um the experience i've had is about like i've worked with external content writers a lot so okay. yeah like copywriting um worked with people who are managing our paid search um i've never worked with like a i want to <laughs> but i've never worked with anyone who manages your um like your creative and your campaigns right um i think that'd be interesting but i also have worked with um, outsourced sort of like website developer developers as well. Yeah. Um, I think it's really, really tricky. Um, my experience, to be honest, working with external copy or content writers has not been great. I, I think we have a, we set a high bar uh, in my current company and in other organizations I've been in for really like good quality content that's yeah. well thought through and I just find it's really difficult to work with someone external and have them produce something that's, that's like going to hit the mark because frankly, they just don't know your right. audience the way that you do. Um, working with outsourced developers and pay, like that, that's been, that's been okay. I think making sure that you have like a Slack channel or something that makes communication easy, very tactical, but I find that useful. And then paid search, amazing. I think that's like the type of thing you should outsource if you have the opportunity to, because it's, you have to be in the tool constantly and optimizing campaigns and it's such a specialized skill. Mm -hmm. So I think um, if you're banking on paid search, like Bing or Google, if you're banking on that, to capture a lot of demand for you, then I would look at like, just like a, yeah, just a partner to, to manage that because I, I we have found that really effective. Cool. That's great. Um, leave us with this. What What is what is um, Megan doing to sharpen her sword, to hone her craft? Uh, do you have, do you have other marketing uh, people in your network or what do you do to sharpen the sword? Yeah, I'm, well, I'm, I've got a coach, which has been really effective, um, more from like a, you know, it's professional development, but like also personal development in terms of how to be an effective leader. Um, so that's been great. And then just from like, a what's happening in marketing, like best practices, that type of thing. I'm part of exit five, which is Dave Gerhardt's community. Um, it's awesome. Uh, so yeah, I love that. Um, and I follow a few people on LinkedIn that I think are really smart. So, um, Chris Walker from refine labs or anything refine labs puts out, I find super useful. They have this thing called the vault, which you can actually access for free. And they kind of talk through their, their methodology for like reporting and, um, how they view, um, the impact or the influence of marketing. So I find that really helpful and actually like, I haven't really found other than exit five, which is more like you go in and you 
Um, they've got good resources and stuff there. It's more of like a, almost like a feed that yeah. you can engage with. I haven't really found any good communities where you're like B2B marketers just like on Slack, like talking and, you know, like shooting a shit like that. I, I don't have any that I have found to be super helpful. So well, yeah. offline, I'll share a couple uh, suggestions. I oh, think that's sweet. The, yeah. You know, the whole idea here is that we we are playing a game and there's a lot of different ways to play it. And if you can get different perspective, um, that that's super helpful. And that's why I want to thank you for sharing a little glimpse into your world and how you're playing. Yeah, of course. Game. Um, because I think it's very relevant to a lot of different marketing leaders out there, especially in, in an industry like yours. So uh, thank you. Do you have any questions for me? I like to ask this at the end. Oh, putting me on the spot. I So I started a podcast for Dig way back when, like three years ago. And the secret mission of the podcast was I just wanted to talk to our buyers on right. a weekly basis. What was the purpose of you starting your podcast? Like, I, it's a lot of work. Like, what was the yeah. like, okay, you know what? It's worth It's worth my time and energy. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think the central mission was to cure a wide variety of different exposures to this marketing leadership profession and wanting to add value to my audience, which is marketing leaders. I found that just sharing my own perspective and lived experience got old pretty quickly because I represent yeah. one lens. And so the value for me is in the variety of industries represented, of tenures represented, of challenges that people experience. And the more uh, accounts that I can share from, from people like you, the better the picture comes into clarity that you can play this game a lot of different ways, right? So yeah, that was it for me. <laughs> yeah. There's no part of my, of my effort here that is uh, meant to be uh, mass reach and, you know, getting sponsors for the show. Oh so, yeah, so, no. It's a way to add value. Yeah through others, borrowing the authority of others. Love it. Well, thanks very much for having me on. Thank you for sharing. It's it's awesome. Everyone, my guest, Megan Healy from Dig Insights, VP of Marketing. Thank you so much.